after decades of waiting and speculation, Confession of the Flesh has finally been published in France in 2018 and has just been translated into English by Robert Hurley. Of this book, the fourth and last volume of the History of Sexuality, we were in possession of a nearly completed version, even though sickness had prevented Foucault from revising part of the typescript. There is always a form of disappointment when the secret has finally been revealed, a secret that has long held researchers and students in suspense, comparing Confessions of the Flesh to Kafka's The Castle, another great interrupted text that seems to leave the entire body of work forever open, infinite. If a mystery remains, it is probably not in the volume published in 2018, with its smooth and transparent writing, like that which had already astonished the readers of The Use of Pleasure and the Care of the Self in 1984. It is rather to be found in the silent and underground work that prepared it from 1977 to 1974. 1984, as testified by no less than seven boxes held today at the Bibliothèque Nationale de France, to which could be added three boxes of lecture notes. Confessions of the Flesh is evidently the book on which the philosophers spend the most time, and indeed the first thing which the archive reveals to us is that, from the publication of The Will to Knowledge until his death, Foucault never stopped his work on and his reworking of the Christian volume. If the preparation of the published version in 2018 can be found in three boxes, four other boxes are dedicated to the older redactions of the Confessions. That is 1,257 sheets of paper often difficult to date precisely, where different versions and drafts are intermingled, and only five precious tables of contents and a few numberings of chapters or parts guide us with a degree of assurance. In this archive flux, however, it is possible, I think, to identify three significant moments which bear witness to three ways of approaching the initial problem announced in 1975 in a series of lectures entitled Abnormal. The problem of the history of the confession of sexuality. These moments do not correspond to three different manuscripts, but three periods in which the reading of the sources and the writing of Foucault, the writing of Foucault are guided by the same narrative. First moment, modern confession as a problem of government. Second moment, sexuality between relation to oneself and manifestation of the self. Third moment, the flesh as experience. Before presenting these three moments, let us make two prefatory remarks which complement and correct the way we have been accustomed to presenting this editorial story. First remark, whereas in 1976 Foucault gives as a title for the projected second volume on Christianity, The Flesh and the Body, from 1977, beginning with the German edition of The Will to Knowledge, he changes this title to Confession of the Flesh. Second remark, the consultation of the successive versions of what we can henceforth call by the same title, the Confessions of the Flesh, does not allow us to isolate a neat rupture or a radical questioning of the project between 1977 and 1984. We are rather witnessing throughout the folders a series of shifts which do not stop enlarging historically and thematically the initial project. Twice, as we will see, the first chapter of the programmed work swells to the point of becoming a whole section of the book, which in turn becomes an entire book itself. It is only the bare comparison of the limit points 1977 and 1984 
which can give us the impression of a qualitative leap towards an entirely different project, obscuring the continuity and coherence of a work that we would like here to retrace. First moment, the manuals of the confessors are not boring to death, 1977-1979. The first version of Confessions of the Flesh was for a long time ima imagined under the influence of what Foucault had said about it retrospectively in 1984, I nearly died of boredom writing this book. This abandoned book would have just been a long, austere and monotonous development on the confession of sins in the greenness of the confessional manuals and treaties since the 16th century. However, this first version, written around 1977-1979, um, we now know, thanks to the archive, to have been not just a simple extension of the commentaries on the manuals of the confessors, heard in the series of lectures abnormal in 1975, even if it does include this initial material. What makes it captivating in the many passages which have been conserved is the effort to place the apparatus of Catholic confession during the 16th, 18th centuries within the new and larger framework of the government of men, bringing together, therefore, abnormal and security territory population. The series of lecture of 1978. This is not without tensions between the old material and the new framework, as we shall see. To roughly sum up the gap, we could say that for Foucault, confession is first and foremost a discourse, whereas government is a practice. Let us explain. From the first draft of Confessions, we have firstly three handwritten versions of the introduction, which take up and deepen an important question of method already briefly addressed in Abnormal. What is the historical reality of confession as read through the confessor's manuals? Did the people confess so well and so regularly? Certainly not, Foucault immediately admits. Confessions botched, poorly understood and unequally imposed, the manuals describe an ideal far removed from pastoral reality, but the manuals retain all their importance as invention in the order of discourse that will only be truly effective many centuries later in its revival by medicine or psychiatry. What interests Foucault is not the experience of confession, but its existence as utterance. The elaboration of schemas of intervention which are first of all a certain way of demarketing new objects in discourse and defining new modes of enunciation within it. The first version of Confessions, however, goes farther than this archaeological analysis at the surface level of the text. The three surviving introductions situate the study of the techniques of confession within a larger project whose vocabulary is an ambiguously that of security territory population. Government of individuals, conduct of men, intensification of pastoral power. With the same attention to this period of the 15th, 17th centuries as a time in which the conduct of men was to become a religious and political problem of primary importance. However, if government is also a fact of discourse, ranging from disquisitions to words of advice to exemplary models, it is first an art. A practice that is always fragile, never guaranteed, and which must be practiced. An art that goes, therefore, way beyond a scheme about which the only question had previously been in the case of the manuals, whether or not it was applied. If it, if it is not a scheme that can be applied, it is because it concedes an autonomy to individuals, which power will later appropriate in the form of the subject, 
as shown by this period of the 15th, 17th century, which Foucault describes precisely as the age of the subject. But what is a subject in this first version of the Confessions? The 16th century subjects read by Foucault is not yet situated exactly at this point of equilibrium between self-government and the government of others, as the analysis of the 80s will define it. Let's go back to the meaning of government in the 1978 lecture. To govern is not to impose a law, it's not to command, it's not to reign. It is to act on others in such a way that they themselves will act in a certain way. It is not, therefore, to deny their freedom, but on the contrary, to solicit them in such a way that they bind themselves freely to themselves by taking care of their own conduct. What the age of reforms needs, therefore, is indeed a subject which relates to itself. But this relationship to oneself remains caught in a cycle of subjection, where freedom, barely discovered, finds itself trapped by becoming its own task. To reform itself, to order itself to a principle, by regular practice or knowledge, through techniques of confession and, more broadly, of government. Despite this cycle of subjection, Foucault recognizes from the first version of Confessions of the Flesh differences of intensity between the two poles of government, self and others, throughout Christian history, as evidenced in an important passage of this first version. The one devoted to the movement of the Devotio Moderna of the 14th, 15th century. This movement is remarkable, Foucault tells us, because it came not from the ecclesiastical authority, but from below, from groups of the faithful. What this movement of the Devotio Moderna seeks, like the Begards, the Third Order, is a regulated life like that of the monks, emancipated from the tutelage of the clergy. Foucault goes so far as to speak of a will to be ruled, which paradoxically springs from a certain spirit of independence, often mistrust and sometimes hostility towards the clergy. Anticipating the age of reformation, these lay people are reappropriating the spiritual art born in the monasteries, that of examination and meditation, but they do it by themselves and for themselves. This is a fine example of counter contexts which are not, as Foucault on the line in his 1988, 1978 sorry, lectures, against the pastorate, but within pastoral care. If the heart of this first version is medieval and then reformed Christianity, one can already hear the call of the open sea, the study of a longer the study of longer-term historical mutations. The question of the subject and of government opens a new field of research, which from 1978 onwards will dive into the depth of Christian history in two different ways. In this first version, Foucault underlines that ancient monasticism very early provoked what he calls a dimorphism of Christian life, a divorce between a strong, codified and close direction, that of the monks, and a more distant, relaxed direction, uncertain in its application, that of the laity. In the most elaborate and surviving plan of this first version, it was supposed to open with a chapter entitled The Care of Souls. No chapter in the archives bears this title, but it is very likely, for reasons of chronological coherence, that this first chapter was concerned with the analysis of the direction and of the pastorate in the first Christian centuries, in line with the lectures of February 1978, Foucault's first real analysis of the Church Fathers. Christian antiquity, therefore, already has its place in the first project of the history of confession, 
But the 1978 lectures, as well as some, as some drafts from this first project, still bear witness to a hasty, at least very summary, way of reading the Church Fathers. Foucault does not hesitate to bring together authors of various epochs who wrote for different audiences and in response to different problems. We thus pass without a warning from Tertullian to Augustine and from Augustine to Cassian. All read solely through the prism of direction and of government. The 1980 series of lectures on the government of the living offers a deeper study of this corpus in the slow form of a commentary on text, more attentive to their historical context and to the displacements they operate in relation to each another. It thus announces a second moment in the project of the Confessions of the Flesh. Second moment, the Church Fathers deserve a volume, 1979-1981. The series of lectures on the government of the living introduces new objects of analysis, focusing on the subject's own part in acts of truth. At the opening of the lecture devoted to Tertullian, we find expressions which announce the pivot to the last Foucault, exercise of self by self, transformation of self by self, ascesis, spirituality. Their novelty lies in the fact that they designate voluntary acts of the subject that Foucault proposes to analyze for themselves independently of their previous programming or their subsequent destiny in a collective structure of government. The historical terrain facilitated, facilitates, facilitates this exclusion of the question of power. Foucault is interested now in a period where the Christian Church has not yet made the direction of all believers an object of reflection, much less a particular technique. Foucault clearly recognizes in 1980 that in the first centuries, the pastoral theme does not coincide with the idea of or technique of direction. Lack of continuous an individualizing direction does not mean, however, that there are no obligations of truth. The discipline of baptism and that of penance require the believer to perform a number of acts that manifest the truth of his preparation. Acts of confession thus remain the field of research, but they are now included in the broader question of the relation between subjectivity and truth, which can encompass very varied types of interactions, forms of manifestation, and modalities of interve interventions by others. This great variety of acts of the subject to which Christian antiquity bears witness prevent us from seeing it as merely a preparation for or modernity. This awareness convinced Foucault that it deserves a volume of its own and not just a chapter. A draft preface to be published in 1984 in the Foucault Reader thus attests to a new plan for the history of sexuality in which the second volume is now, is now entirely devoted to the first centuries of Christianity. Foucault justifies, already there, a marked chronological displacement which led him to place the work's emphasis on what was to have been simply the point of departure or historical background, late antiquity. Despite this prolonged stopover in antiquity, Confessions of the Flesh can still be conceived at this stage of their writing as prolig prolegomena of a long history that must continue through medieval and then modern times, as Foucault announces in a fragment of this second writing moment, the new experience of the flesh in the first centuries 
opens the long history of the knowledge of sex. The perspective of confessional of sexuality has therefore not been modified. This new volume resulted in the drafting, probably around 1980-1981, of passages that were less extensive than in the first version, but sufficiently complete for a preface and an introductory chapter to have been typed and corrected, while some pages were drafted with footnotes in mind. As with the first version of the Confessions, this new version has two successive structures. A first plan, in a single part, giving way to a division into two parts. Let us begin with the second of these two parts, as it has been familiar to us for a long time now. Entitled The Manifestation of Truth, it unsurprisingly traces a royal road towards the confession of the second millennium taking up in their broad outlines the analysis of the course on the government of the living, on the ordeal of baptism, the publication of the self, or the examination of conscience. The first part, on the other hand, is less structured, still uncertain in its contours, and above all contains the disruptive element that will offer Foucault a new terrain, terrain for his curiosity. Entitled The Measure of Pleasures, it already engages the question of Stoic morals, and in particular, marriage in Greco-Roman antiquity. The worm is in the fruit. This second version of Confessions of the Flesh can be recognized in the archive by its synoptic opening motif the moral example of the elephant. An animal praised from Greco-Roman antiquity to Saint Francis de Sales for its monogamous, faithful and modest sexuality. This chapter dedicated to it exists in a typewritten version already quoted and in two handwritten versions. This inaugural mention of the elephant is crucial. In its various pagan and then Christian versions, the conjugality of this mammal now places confession of the flesh under the primary and no longer subordinate question of the relationship between the two antiquities, the pagan and the Christian. A question which concerns our identity. What do we owe to Greek antiquity? What do we owe to Christianity? Greco-Roman antiquity already appeared in the 1978 and 1980 lecture, but its role was limited to a comparison of different techniques of direction and self-examination. The reference to the morals of the elephant now opens the wider question of marriage and what it involves, relationship to sexual pleasure, to the seeds, to procreation. In so doing, this provokes a new shift of the book in preparation. In this new field of the rules of conjugal life, the techniques of direction and more broadly the acts of truth required of the subject become, if not secondary, at least insufficient to establish a partition between the two antiquities. And this for two reasons. First of all, as we have seen, the Christian pastoral care of the first centuries does not include techniques of direction. Secondly, the acts of truth in the first centuries are limited to certain moments and rituals of the Christian's life. They do not impact on everyday life. In short, the moral life is not only a matter of telling the truth. It is therefore necessary to extend the domain of comparison between the antiquities to the dimensions of what Foucault will then name an experience. This key term, from the lecture series Subjectivity and Truth of 1981 and from the introduction to the use of pleasure in 1984, is used 
several times in this second version of Confessions. Foucault distinguishes here two components of experience. There is a subjective domain that one experiences in the first person and a field of objects, objects to be known and analyzed. It is therefore not a simple notion since it is divided between an element of passivity and an element of activity. The appearance of this notion has two remarkable consequence for the consequences for the project of Confessions of the Flesh. Firstly, it reorganizes the constitutive elements of the Christian flesh around the relationship that the individual maintains with itself, studied in its historical form. Secondly, it opens a wider field of historical analysis which now precedes in the plan of the book the narrow question of the manifestation of truth of the self. A manifestation which is only one modality of experience among others, in Christianity as in pagan culture. But here is the thing. By asking what Christianity brought to moral experience, Foucault believes at the beginning that he can get rid of the false answer answers in a simple chapter, the one on the morals of the elephant precisely. Highlighting the continuity of the conjugal precepts, he shows that it is not on this level that the Christian difference is played out. But in order to demonstrate the continuity of the precepts, we first have to grasp the coherence of pagan morals, in particular Stoic morals, which Christianity encountered in its early days. As with the Church Fathers, Foucault realized that he could not synthesize in a few lines what would be the culmination of pagan morals, while overlooking its complex history and the various philosophical currents that preceded it. A new movement of deepening begins here, where Foucault's concern for rigor is mixed with this curiosity that has become his ethic of research. We are coming to the conclusion of this history of draft and revision. The comparison between the two ancient morals, <coughs> morals now requires first one, then two volumes devoted to Greco-Roman antiquity. <coughs> this will be the use of pleasure, already planned in May uh, 1982, and then the care of the self. Above all, this comparison makes it necessary to begin reading the fathers no longer through the lens of the manifestations of the truth of the self, but by the management of natural pleasures, the aphrodisia, in Clement of Alexandria. As is the case in the last version of Confessions, on which Foucault was working in 1984. A last version that we would like to mention now briefly by showing the way in which once again it overturns the initial project. Third and last moment, finishing where we thought we started, 1981-1984. In the autumn of 1982, the Gallimard Publishing House received from Foucault the final manuscript of Confessions of the Flesh, the writing of which must have taken place from 1981 to 1982, becoming now the fourth volume of the history of sexuality. Confessions are certainly the last. Though Foucault does mention the following study in it, the 1984 introduction to the use of pleasure does not herald a fifth volume. This means that the confessions of the flesh have, strangely enough, freed themselves and perhaps finally from the obligation to account for the modern discourse on sexuality in the form of the confession. This has a first remarkable consequence for the final version, because it no longer points towards the generalization of confession. 
Foucault removes in this last version what was nevertheless the constantly announced horizon of his analysis of the first Christian centuries, at least since 1978. The resolution in the second millennium of the dimorphism of Christian life, that is to say, the final institutional reconciliation of the lay person and the monk, of the exomologesis and the, and the exagoresis of Tertullian and of Cassian. This reconciliation was supposed to have been accomplished by modern confession at the end of a long history which would have had which would have had no other destiny than to intertwine these two practices and statuses, statuses more frequently and even more narrowly. But nothing went as planned. In the last version of Confessions, instead of the two series of techniques destined to converge in the second millennium, Foucault draws in fact at the very end of the book, the contours of a common base of experience, no longer between the monk and the layman, but between the monk and the spouses. In the same analysis of the subject of concupiscence, the resolution is no longer something yet to come, because it has already been accomplished by Augustine and the spiritual struggle, bringing together the exercise of virginity and the practice of marriage. This is an experience of the self, which is no longer a relationship with the confessor. This is an experience which dates from the 5th and no longer from the 16th century. Confession of the flesh close on the experience of a desire, which internalizes the history of sexuality in the analysis of the self. Foucault's final choice was to prefer to end his history of sexuality by another history that should have been the beginning, but is now sufficient in itself, that of ancient moral experience, experience which is something other than the initially announced history of the confession of sexuality. Instead, of an historical, precise identification of a mutation of the church and its pastoral care, we have now an elusive announcement of the links established by our culture between sex, truth, and law. At the very end of Confessions of the Flesh, Foucault seems to loosen the bounds of causality and unfold the richness of a world, a culture, where it is a question of techniques of the self, but also of the art and rules of life, of problems and, and ideas, of doctrines and the spiritual meaning of conducts. Late antiquity is of importance not only for genealogical reasons, but because it offers to our modern eyes astonishing models of moral life, both free and positive, the very things that we are unable to invent for ourselves today. Thank you very much.